We're in Romans 1. Uh, what does it say? Romans 1, 21 through 28. So let me start by, uh, by reading that here. Romans 1, 21 through 28. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason... God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So we were looking through uh, these verses, and we ended on around verse, uh, you know, I think it was verse 21, um, where it talks about they knew God, but they near glorified him as God. And the, the question we're on is number 41, which is what is the result of the natural man's wrong response? So we see the wrong response to what they know about God. And what was that, what was that result? What, what happened? Paul wrote, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now the simple answer, um, say what was the result, is they had futile thinking and darkened hearts. Uh, but then what does that mean? Um, they did that to themselves, didn't they? Yes, yes, yes. It starts off with what they reject, and then God gives them over, you'll see, it's sort of progressive. Um, did and they already know God? It and says, um, it says look at the very first, look, see the very first part of the verse? They knew God. For oh, although they yes. knew God. Yes. Oh, now, right there. We, studied, we talked about this last week, that natural revelation is enough for people to reject. Um, and, and generally, and I say almost in all cases that I'm aware of, uh, natural revelation leads to rejection. Um, so they're without excuse. That's, that's what we saw, the natural revelation. It says, so they knew God. What did they know about God? We asked that question last week. They knew enough to be responsible. Uh, they, they could tell at least two attributes of God, his divine power, his, his uh, eternal power and divine nature. So his, um, uh, we would say his um, omnipotence, you know, it's all powerful. And his, uh, his big fancy word in theology, aseity, but the self-existence of God. So both of those things, they can tell from, uh, they can tell some aspects of that in nature, enough for them to be without excuse. So they knew God, but they, they didn't honor him. So they saw this, they realized that there was a God Maybe didn't know him personally, but they rejected that and they went a different direction. Um, and because of that, it says that two things happened. Their, their thinking became futile and their hearts were darkened. The word futile, um, whenever I don't understand something, I just, I go to a Bible hub. It's one of my favorite places to go to. And I click on the verse and I drill into the word and I look at the word. And the word futile uh, means to become aimless or pointless. Um, so their thinking is aimless, their thinking is pointless. Um, it, there's, or you might even say purposeless. Uh, you might say that their life has no meaning. Um, they, they have no direction, no purpose. Now, they may think they have purpose and meaning, but when they get to the end of what they're pursuing, how many times have you heard somebody say, I was climbing the ladder, and I finally reached success, and I realized that it was empty. I mean, I've heard that testimony many times from very successful people who are honest enough to share what, what they're going through. Um, this is really a life without direction, is what he's saying. Uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, if you read Ecclesiastes, is a really interesting study. Um, he captures this as vanity, um, which is it's a really, really difficult word to translate. Um, the Hebrew word is hevel, which is smoke. Um, and the idea is all these things that they see in life, they, they see and it seems like it's real. They reach up and they grab it and it just passes through their hands, this idea of smoke. It's the, it's the Hebrew word for smoke, or you might see sometimes it's vapor or a breath in, in cold air, things like that, that it's there and it's just gone. Um, and if you see smoke when it's billowing, you can kind of see images. Just like when you look at clouds, you can see, oh, look, there's a dragon and there's a whale and there's a plane and, you know, those kinds. Of, it's that idea that it's, it's this, this, this smoke and you think you see something, it's like a mirage, you get close to it and it's gone. That's, that's the idea that Ecclesiastes tells us. Um, it's the appearance of substance. But as you get close to grab it, it slips through your fingers. And that's kind of the idea, I think, that Paul is capturing here. Their thinking becomes futile. They believe that it's real. 
and they pursue it, and they, they, they give themselves purpose by inventing purpose, and then they chase that purpose, and in the eternal state, it's, it's nothing. It's just a vapor. It's gone. Um, and the darkened hearts, what does that mean? The Greek phrase literally says, was darkened in their foolish hearts. And, um, and in, it's, it's, in, Greek is a little different than English in that it puts the important part at the front of the, pay, at front of the sentence. So you can see a sentence, and whatever is at the first, that's, that's the important part. So the darkened part of their hearts is the important part, but notice how it describes their heart. It's a foolish heart. It's so their foolish heart. So it says, darkened is their foolish heart, is what it says. So um, now, does anybody remember uh, from Psalms what it says a fool says in his heart? No God. There's no God. Psalm 14, 1. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Um, at the center of every person where there is the knowledge of God, um, if it is to have any positive effects, must be embraced. Instead, to them, this settled this darkness, a darkness that only the light of the gospel can penetrate. Um, the natural man's heart is dark to light, um, and the God of this world works to keep it blinded so people can't see the light of the gospel. Um, the only thing that can save them is light from outside of themselves. That's the gospel. And, um, and in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6, and we'll, I'll talk more about it in the, um, in the service next, but... Um, I think one of the greatest description of salvation is found in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. But let me read 4 through 6 here. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So not only are their hearts darkened, you've got the God of this world blinding their minds so they can't see the light that's there. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, this is the verse 6, For God who said, um, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is a description of salvation. Um, and it's really interesting. We'll talk more about it in the next, uh, in the next service. But um, it's a really interesting comparison he makes here. He's equating this with creation. Mm -hmm. The very first words that God uttered, does anybody even know what they are? Let there be light, right? Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. That's the first recorded words of God in Scripture. And here, um, uh, Paul is pointing back to that, that same creator God who created everything. And it's a very Jewish way of doing something. We don't, we don't quite see this, but imagine a Bible with no chapters and verses, right? And so how would you tell somebody where to look? Um, their way of doing that is they would quote the very first phrase of a, uh, of, of a thought. Um, so when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the beginning of Psalm 22, right? Isn't it? It's 22. Um, and he was not just saying that, but I believe he was pointing towards that Psalm. Um, and it would recall to a good Jewish mind, uh, especially to the leaders that were there, they would know what Psalm he was referring to. Um, pointing to the messianic psalm that's there. Um, and I believe that's what Paul is doing here. Um, he's saying that God who said, let light come out of, shine out of darkness. So this same creator God, what does he do? He shines into our hearts. So he creates all of life and everything that we see. Um, but he also makes a new creation within us. So really each one of us here is the same, po the power of the gospel is really, I believe, the same power of creation. He created, he created, he makes all things new. He starts a new life. That, that's what salvation is described as, right? Is I can see, I'm alive, I'm made alive, I'm born, it's a new birth. Uh, we say born again. Probably a better translation of that is born from above. Um, I'm born of the spirit. Um, I'm born from above. I was born on earth, but then I was born a second time. I was born from above. All those words talk about something that's new, and Paul is calling that into um, calling into that account. So it isn't just the demonic forces of this world, as I mentioned, keeping the gospel from them. So they, they have their hearts darkened. You've got the God of this world blinding their eyes, but they love it too. Um, David, yeah, go ahead. Did, did God harden their hearts or did they do it to themselves? Yes. <laughs> That's what we just said, both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You, you see both. Okay. Um, and Pharaoh's the one good example. Um, you know, the question is, who hardened first? Uh, it's interesting, before Moses even talked to Pharaoh, God says, I'm going to harden his heart. Even before Pharaoh did it, he said, I'm going to harden his heart. So um, the answer is yes, but 
Uh, so you've got the demonic forces of this world. Um, they, they've darkened their hearts, but they also love the darkness. Uh, John 3, 19 um, and 20, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil, because their deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. For everyone who does wicked things, in verse 20, hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. Mm -hmm. So their, their hearts are darkened, right, on purpose. They, they've done this. We'll see the exchange they make. Um, the God of this world is blinding their minds. Um, and on top of that, they love it. So you've got these three things working against when you share the gospel with somebody. And that's why you cannot save somebody. We can present the gospel and God can take the words that you use and shine into their hearts and make them new. But it's God, as it says, and I think it's First Corinthians 3, where Paul is comparing him and Apollos. He says, we're just the waterers and the planters. God is the one who makes things grow. God is the one who brings life. We just obey and we proclaim, and God is the one that transforms people's lives, speaks into their heart, and makes all things new. So to add one more shocking thing about this process, the tenses of they became futile and was darkened are what's called, and it's just stick with me here, uh, I'll get a little geeky here, um, uh, are heiress passives. And you say, okay, well, that's, that's, that's good. But an heiress describes something. The reason this is important is that tense in Greek is something that describes a point in time where something happened that has continuing effects. Mm -hmm. So you might say, I, well, you could say, and you would be right in saying it, I got married um, almost 20, you know, 21 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that has changed my life from that point on. And so my life, I'm now a married person. And so you would use the aorist tense to say, I'm a married person, meaning I was married back then and that has impacted my life, continues to impact my life. That's how that word is used. So when you see that, that, that tense used, this darkened, and feudal thinking points back to something. And the question is, what is it pointing back to? I believe it's their choice of not honoring God and rejecting him. So they made this choice of not rejecting as a result of them rejecting God, their thinking became futile. Um, really, it all goes back to what they think about God. They reject God, and from that point forward, in God's eyes, they are foolish. Now, that doesn't mean they're dumb. There's a difference here, right? There are people who are foolish spiritually, but are very smart worldly, right? They, they can run circles around me in math, physics, and many, many other things, right? Uh, we're not talking about um, worldly wisdom and uh, you know, understanding of how the world works, or street smarts, you might say. We're talking about the foundational, most important thing, which is, is there a God? And they say no, and their life had deviates from that point. They refuse to honor God, they refuse to acknowledge God, um, I'm thinking of um, one of the two people who discovered that got the Nobel Prize, or I think it was the Nobel Prize for discovering DNA. Um, one of them said, um, when you look at DNA, it looks like it's designed, but the one thing you need to remember is it wasn't designed. <laughs> I mean, that, that is what, I'm, I'm paraphrasing yeah. the quote, but that's what they said. It looks like it was designed, but you have to start off with the understanding of no, it wasn't designed. So really, they're, they're, they, they are denying there's a God, that somebody designed it. And from that point on, spiritually, they're, they're foolish, and it sends them off in these, all these other directions that is deviating from what is true. Um, trails. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean they can't stumble over something and find something out. Yeah. But um, anyway, yeah. I saw a hand somewhere. Well, laws, in a sense, like they always correlate what you're saying to like what's going on at this time. They got that uh, thing in the law about the fruit from the poisonous tree. It's like anything from that point forward changes the whole dynamic right. of, of what's going on with that. And then with the DNA thing, that, that's amazing to me. And I think it was Crick and Watson, I think, with yeah. the two guys, when they showed the double helix and how they know where certain attributes are. I, I went to a lecture in the Carolinas once. It was, it was almost scary because what they were saying, in essence, not only can we do physical characteristics at certain levels on this ladder, we can start putting in... Um, attributes such as you know your personalities yeah and I'm just sitting back as a Christian just cringing thinking who on earth are you gonna give this power to you know it's like, in other words they were all amazed by it but I was like shaking almost because when I got a chance to ask the question I said who would you entrust with this and it's one thing you left out because they brought up some good things about birth defects this but the other side of the coin I just thought you left out a soul you're making yeah. a, a being out of and who put the information there? That's the, that, that's the part that my evolutionist friends can't answer. Really Where did information come from? Yeah, you know. I, it's okay. You can, you can 
I don't agree with it, but you can wave your magic wand and put lots of time there and say that it evolved. Okay, well, but where did the information come from? Okay. Information means there has to be an information mm -hmm. giver and it's ordered information and, and all the, all the biology is oriented towards holding this information and duplicating this information. I mean, it's like a photocopier, it's a factory, it's a, it's a library. I mean, it's all these things that work inside of every single little, it's just amazing. It, what, what we know now is amazing and you just, you yeah. cannot, you, you almost have to close your eyes and plug your ears and say, I, I don't believe there is no God, there's no God, there's no God. It's just, I don't understand how somebody can believe that. But anyway, um, I, I could, I could talk for hours on that. <laughs> um, but anyway, the passive part means it was done by, um, uh, by something other than, in other words, they didn't say, well, I'm going to become futile. They didn't start off saying, well, I'm, you know what I would like to be is futile in my thinking. <laughs> you know, I'd like to be is have darkened hearts, right? They, they made a choice and that choice impacted who they are in the direction that they're heading. They realized they did that at first? Even if they did, because they love the darkness, they're not going to come to the light, even if you present them the truth. In fact, I find that um, when they, the more they love the darkness because of their deeds, the more animosity they have when you shine the light. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't have to, I'm not shining the light in their face. Just the fact that I've been married for 21 years to some people, that just sets them off. It triggers them. Might would be the way to say it now. It just they, they get triggered because of that, or that I have five kids. They're triggered because of that. Uh, they have a stable home. They're triggered because of that. They come to church. They're triggered. I mean, just the the triggering is. I, I don't even have to do anything. I'm just living my life, trying to be more Christ-like and trying to live quiet. You know, like like Peter says, uh, a quiet life and peaceable. But they see that as an animosity. They want to push what they believe off on others. We'll we'll see here in a second. In essence, um, the darkness and the futility, I believe, um, could be, some people do interpret that as, a, as part of a confirmation from God. So you do see some places in the Old Testament where, where God blinded their eyes or God hid the truth because they had already rejected. So he hides so they don't. Um, for example, when we were going through Mark, I mean, you remember in Mark where the disciples say, why do you teach him parables? Remember, remember, do you remember what he said? So they, so they won't understand and they won't believe. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's because shocking. That blew me away. <laughs> um, but that's not, that's, not a, um, um, that's not a foreign concept because in the Old Testament, when people reject and reject and reject, there comes a point in time where God confirms that rejection. Yes. Um, is that where it says, lest they come to the light of right? the glorious gospel? Right, mm -hmm. right. So uh, what the answer here uh, to the question, what was the result of the natural man's wrong response? Their thinking became futile and their hearts were darkened. Mm -hmm. So question 42 is, what is the reality of the natural man? And that's found in verse 22. Um, Paul writes, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And we talked a little bit about this, but the Greek literally says this, professing to be wise, in other words, they professing to be wise, they became fools. And the reason I say that, even though it's very similar, um, the word professing there is in the present tense, which means they keep saying it. Like they're trying to convince you. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm really smart. We're all smart. Everybody agrees with me. Therefore, we're right. And um, I'm wise. Look at me. I'm really wise. No, really, I'm wise. If I told you how wise I am, all these other people agree with me that I'm wise. They are wise. We are wise. You're the stupid one. <laughs> they try to make you feel dumb because you don't agree with them. And they keep saying you know, how this is wisdom and this is agreed or this is settled fact or get on the right side of history. I mean, I hear that phrase a lot, right? That's the same thing as saying we're smart and we're headed in the right direction. You need to follow us. Yeah, because some of the smartest people in the world will not accept this. Yeah, if anybody ever, if anybody ever says uh, get on the right side of history, I found a really good answer. I heard it from somebody, so I'm kind of stealing it, but um, you just say how long are the history you're measuring? <laughs> A <laughs> hundred years or a trillion years? Because, right, yeah. right, and who is the ultimate victor? Yeah, right. right, and that's the thing is, short term, yes, the wrong, right side of history, but I'm looking, I'm playing the long game, right. you know, yeah. when Christ comes back and he rules this world and we're in the eternal state, um, that's the kind of history I want to be on the right side of. Yeah. So, anyway, um, so if a fool keeps... Uh, oh, sorry. No matter how much a fool tells you they are smart, if they say there is no God, they are a fool. Mm -hmm. that, that's how God sees it. Now, I'm, I don't go around calling people fools. Don't get me wrong. But, um, but that's how God sees them. If, they, if the person says there is no God, they're a fool. 
you know? And I keep that in my mind, knowing I'm talking with somebody who doesn't even have a foundation for me to have this conversation, there is a God. They don't believe there's a God. I'm saying that God came to save you. Well, if they don't believe there's a God, I'm just talking, talking, you know, so I tend to get a little uh, confrontational with, uh, with their lifestyle because it says because they love their deeds, they're hiding from the light, so I shine the light on the deeds, and that's where the, the pressure point is to get them to pay attention. But anyway, I well, won't get into that. I have a Christian mom. Honestly, I always knew God existed. I didn't know him personally, but at least I knew. Right. And unfortunately, um, we have a generation that's being brought up where that isn't even, there's no foundation for that. Um, anymore, which makes, you might say it makes things more difficult, but in a way, who is closer to God? The people who claimed to know God when Jesus was alive or the people who knew they were sinners? As the people who knew that they were in need of a physician, right? And so you might look at that as hopeless, but in a way, um, you you kind of strip this veneer off and people reveal who they really are. Now you can deal with the situation, right? Um, so th- there are pros and cons to either side, but from a witnessing standpoint, I suspect that, that uh, things may get a little easier because all that veneer of, I know God, and I was raised this way, and that is uh, stripped away, and so now you're dealing with where they really are. So um, the answer to this question here, it's, it's not very long talking about it because it's very, fairly uh, straightforward, but what is the reality of the natural man? Their very claim to be wise demonstrate they are fools. Uh, they claimed to be wise, but they became fools. Um, the question 43, what exchange was made? Paul writes in verse 23 and 25. Uh, 23 says they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. The, verse 25 says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So the exchange was made as glory for images and truth for lie. Um, Verse 23 says they gave up God's glory for images made to look like man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Um, now, this section, remember, is directed, I believe, to the Gentiles. Uh, chapter 2 starts them addressing to the Jews, but he starts off addressing the Gentiles. Um, but a Jew would recognize what Paul is doing here. Um, early in the formation of the Israeli nation, there were many warnings against idolatry. Again and again, God warned, no other images before me. Don't make any idols. Don't get distracted by these other nations that are going to be with you. I mean, if you read through the Bible and you read the Old Testament, you see in the, in the Pentateuch, the first five books, how many times God said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Um, and one such warning is found in Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 18. See if this sounds familiar to what Paul just said. Therefore, now God is talking to, um, through Moses to, um, to Israel. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. So except for the fish, Paul copied in the same order what shows up in Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 18. He says, man, birds, animals, and creeping things. And uh, in Deuteronomy uh, 4, 15 through 18, he says, male or female, animal, bird, um, or creeping things. So same, same order. So to a Jew hearing this, they would know what, what they're doing. Now, Israel failed this over and over and over again. In fact, um, there are several reasons why uh, God says he sent them into Babylon exile, spe- specifically the southern kingdom. Um, but, uh, but one reason was idolatry. Um, and um, what's interesting is when they came back, they were very anti-image. In other words, they were anti-idolatry, almost extremely so, and they bragged about that a lot. Um, in fact, even within 100 years of as, as Jesus was alive before and after, they, they would give their lives to keep idols away from the temple uh, because they, they, they knew it had been ingrained into their the, the, the pattern or the fabric of their society that there should be no idols. God said, no idols, no idols. Look at what God did for us. We don't want that to happen again. So we're going to be holy because God says no idols, so no idols. They were very anti-image. So David, my drugs were my idol, weren't they? Yes, idolatry can be more than just an image that you have, yeah. but yes, wow. yes. It's anything, um, if I would define idolatry, I would simply define it as anything you place before God. Okay. Um, okay. In fact... I like this definition. And I don't remember where I got it. It said, an idol is anything we hide 
um, we hide behind to avoid the light of God's glory or the truth. We hide behind it. Mr. talks about the creeping thing on that list you mentioned as Ferraris. Mm. Yes. So, Cars. Cars. Yeah, anything you put before God, anything, anything you find comfort in besides God. I never thought of it like that. However, so while the Jewish people could say, oh, look at the Gentiles, idolatry. Now they looked at images. Now they had idolatry in other areas, but um, that's not how they would see it. They would say, we're not idolaters, but look at the Gentiles. It was very, most of the Gentile believers probably most likely came from a very idolatrous situation. Um, they would have associated with one God or another, and they were saved out of that. So this would be very, they would understand this exchange that these people are making because they would recognize themselves in that exchange. Um, it was closer in mind to the Gentile believer because most of them were saved out of it. Um, that people would exchange the, the, that people would exchange the glory of an immortal God who is not subject to decay or to um, demise for what will die indicates the foolish stupidity of the natural man. In other words, you've got the immortal God, and Paul calls that out. Here's an immortal God. And what are they exchanging immortality for? <laughs> They're exchanging for something that's going to burn and fade away. Um, we'll see in Isaiah, um, Isaiah uh, 44 that God calls, um, and God calls the idols ashes. Mm-hmm. And you'll see why. It's a really interesting, uh, um, and, and we'll, I, I want to read it because I think it's really important. But uh, what did they get for this unholy exchange? They got a corruptible idol. Um, more importantly for them, they get a God that they could craft in their own image. Right? I make the idol. I make the religion. So therefore, I can make it accept anything that I want to do. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm simplifying it. But, but, but in essence, and um, I can't remember where it says. It's in the New Testament. Uh, I believe that behind every idol is a demonic power. So Satan's best work is not uh, what what movies say it is, it's in religion. Religion is where his best work is done. And, uh, and false religions, especially, well, only the false religions, um, that, that's where his work is done best. And so behind every idol, behind every false religion, behind every false prophet is the demonic power. Um, and uh, that's a pretty scary thing to think about. But notice that the two exchanges that Paul describes, one says is idol and the other one says it's a lie. This almost parallel um, so looking at 23, they exchanged glory for images. And 23, they exchanged truth uh, for a lie. Image is a lie, mm-hmm. and glory is the truth, right? So both the glory and the truth, they exchange for the lie and, um, and images. So I want to read this larger passage. Um, and I know um, we have enough time, but I think it's really important to see this because every human being struggles with idolatry. If we're honest with ourselves, we, we struggle with that. And it's um, the longer you are, you've walked in, uh, in, in your spiritual walk with the Spirit, you know that um, killing or burning idols or casting them down or grinding them into dust and throwing them in the brook Kidron like they did in the, uh, in the Old Testament, um, th- those kinds of things, it's like a whack-a-mole. You kill one and another one pops up, and then you kill that one and another one pops up, and it's just a constant uh, struggle um, in, our, in our sanctification. I um, mean, it doesn't end when we become a child of God uh, through salvation. Uh, one of my influ- influential writers wrote, the human mind is a perpetual forge of idols. Um, Liz actually quoted this. Um, I looked up the quote, and I thought I always said factory of idols, but it actually says forge of idols. What I know is the same thing, but the actual quote says, the human mind is a perpetual forge of idols. You kill one, and another one pops up. Um, so I think it's, under, it's helpful to understand how God sees idols and how how important it is in our hearts to be killing those idols. Um, Isaiah 44, um, starting in verse 9, I want to read this. It's a very descriptive. This is God speaking. And around this, like a few chapters before and a few chapters after, um, uh, God actually gets very sarcastic with idol, idolaters. Um, he, he also he kind of mocks them in a very sarcastic way of how stupid they are. And, oh, you think you're so smart. Why don't you come and tell me what's going to happen before it happens? I can do it. And I'm not even going to tell you before, too much before, because then you can say, oh, I, I predicted it. He goes back and forth. And so this one here in Isaiah 44, 9, all who fashions idols are nothing. And the things they delight in do not profit. Now, I want you, as you read this, think of yourself. You know in your heart of hearts what those idols are for you. So think about how God is seeing this idolatry here. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a God or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They will be terrified. They shall be put to shame together." 
The ironsmith takes a cutting tool, works it over the coals, he fashions it with a hammer and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. So he's talking about the people who make the idols. In other words, you say, who made God? Well, men make their own gods. They make these images and this very person is so weak, he has to eat and he gets tired. Then he talks about the carpenter, uh, stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into a figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. Uh, so again, here's a, a corruptible person making this idol. Now here's where I think it gets interesting. He cuts down cedars. He chooses a cypress tree or an oak. He lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and he warms himself. So he, cut, he cuts down a tree. Part of it, he like makes a fire and he warms himself. And he um, uh, warms himself. He kindles a fire and he bakes bread. He also makes a god and worships it. <laughs> so you cut down a tree, you cut it in half. Half of it, you make a god and you worship it. The other half, you cut into kindling and you make your food and you, you, burn, you burn it. Remember, it goes to ashes. Just keep that in your mind. Um, uh, he makes a god and worships it. He makes an idol, falls down before it. Half of it, he burns in the fire. Over the other half, he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And then the rest of he makes into a god his idol. He falls down to worship it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern. For he has shut their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. You see, this kind of answers your question. There's another one of those parts where here's an idolatrous person. And god says, That's it. Just going to shut your eyes and shut your mind so you can't understand. No one considers, nor is there any knowledge or discernment to say, oh, hmm, you see the sarcasm. Hmm, half of it I burned in the fire, and I bake bread on its coals. I roasted meat, and I've eaten, and I shall make the rest of it. What shall I do with the rest of it? Oh, I'll make an idol. I'll make an abomination. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Um, then this is, the, this is the killing, this is, I don't know, the, the, the killer part is verse 20. He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart, you might say um, a darkened heart, has led him astray. He cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? So I'm holding the idol. Is this not a lie? Yeah. Right? He, he, he doesn't even have the wherewithal. His thinking is so futile and his heart is so darkened. He can't even think, am I, what am I holding in my hand? Is this even a lie? And notice how idolatry and lying are both together. They're both lies. Um, and this is how God views idolatry. It's just ridiculous. It's illogical. And if somebody had common sense, right, they weren't a fool, they could look at that and see this is ridiculous. And we say, well, that's a good thing. I don't have an idol at home. Um, but I would mm -hmm. ask you, do you have an idol in your heart? Is there something that you find comfort in that you look to when things are difficult? Is there a room, is there a room in your heart that you don't let the light of truth shine into? Sometimes. You know it's a lie. And you keep that door closed, right? It's something you hide behind so the light of truth and the light of God's glory doesn't shine on because you know if you open that door and God came in that you would be convicted because your deeds inside that room or the things you were doing um, uh, may be misdirected. And it may not be something that is evil, right? It could be family. It could be a car. It could be work. It could be job. It could be prestige. It could be money. And none of those things in and of themselves are bad, but when you place them above God... Um, then they become an idol in your hearts. I was going to say, I think Joe uh, mentioned just a small part in that last sermon about a partial pardon. That kind of opened up a lot when you said that to me anyways, because I was always thinking, how do these people get to this point? You know, like, but I think he touched upon it with the partial hardening, and you mentioned Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Yes. So, and, and sometimes I even wonder, if, if you start thinking about it, did someone have to be Judas? Was that person appointed to play that role or was that just circumstance because it was prophesied ahead of time well because it was predicted and god said it was going to happen it wasn't uh it wasn't chance it wasn't coincidence it was planned and i wonder if that person pays a penalty or he had to yes someone had to play, he says role. Get, jesus says that so whoa it, it's just, it makes me think sometimes woe to the man to I, I can't that. remember the quote somebody can probably help me with the quote but jesus says woe to that man by which yeah. the son of man is betrayed didn't someone have to do with them? I'm just feeling like, yes. boy, you were made to play that role. But, Judas. but notice here, but, but notice here, we're looking in Romans 1, yep. that uh, they chose to reject God. <sighs> they headed down that path, right? Um, and how many people have headed down this path? Every single person in the history of the world is headed down this path. Only by a miracle, by a creation miracle, is somebody yeah. saved from it. 
So they, uh, I think it says in, in John three seventeen, it says that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. They are already condemned. They, yeah. They're already in a state of condemnation. Jesus didn't have to come in and condemn them. John 3, they're, yeah, they're already condemned, mm-hmm. right? They're living a life of condemnation. Yeah. And what we're going to see is what God does in response to this unholy exchange is he lets them have what they want. Um, but let's, let's finish this part. So either the Lord is worshipped here or people assume that role. Um, the first option, worshipping the Lord, brings spiritual wholeness. Um, the second option brings a hopeless self-deification, a futile thinking, darkened hearts. Um, this all, and what's interesting is this unholy exchange is reversed in two parables that Jesus gave. It just came to me as I was studying this. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. You're going to know these parables. Uh, they're just a couple sentences. They're short parables. Remember the parable of the treasure in the field? Remember the parable of the pearl of great price, one right after the other? Remember what each one of those men did? They sold all that they had. They took everything in the world. They sold it all because this, they wanted the treasure that was in the field that was representative of the kingdom of God. The pearl of great price, he sold all that he had so he could purchase the pearl of great price. So here you have in Romans 1, somebody who exchanges the treasure for things that are fleeting for the world. So they exchange and say, I want the world, so I'm going to give this up. But in these parables, the man who loves the kingdom of heaven or loves salvation, he sells everything. So you see the opposite here. There's a positive and a negative. Um, and that's, that's what salvation is. I'm willing to give everything up because this is greater value. But a person of the world who's natural says, this has no value whatsoever. I want this over here. So they exchange this for that. Yeah, and I've heard it another way. Rather than we do the work to being the kingdom, what happens is that it is Christ yes. that wants the seed of, in the field, and the field is Israel, so he gives up everything he's got to purchase the field. The pearl of great price is a Gentile, and so what he does is he gives up everything he has to purchase the Gentile uh, field, uh, pearl of great price, which is, co- mm-hmm. is culturally wrong, Yeah. and uh, so it was Christ gives up stuff, everything. He gave up his relationship with the Father right. on the cross. And, he, uh, he set it aside. Hey. Yeah, he set it aside. Well, yeah, where, where are you, Lord? Where are you, Father? Right. And um, so, yeah. So yep. I've heard that it, it's Christ that paid the price rather than we paid yeah. the price. And regardless of how you interpret those two parables, you can see the oppositeness, I'm making up a word, the, uh, the opposite um, comparison of what's happening in Romans 1, where somebody gives up the glory and wants what's corruptible. Um, mm-hmm. Here, on the other side, you have somebody who gives up what's corruptible and gains what's, mm-hmm. what's immortal, the kingdom of heaven, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what exchange was made? The answer, the glory was exchanged for images, and the truth of God was exchanged for a lie. In other words, glory for images and truth for lies. That's, that's what the that's exchange they were made. And I want to end on, on this one here um, in the time that we have left, about 10 minutes or so. What is God's response to this exchange? Uh, Paul writes in verse 24, 26, and 28. So three times it says God gave them up. Very consistent. Um, and when God says something once, you should listen to it. When he says it twice, definitely listen to it. Three times, really should be paying attention. It should jump out at you. So... Um, This, the reason I want to take a little time on this is because this goes against how we as Christians tend to talk. Um, And I mean Christian media, Christian culture here in in our culture. We tend to think that judgment is the fall of a civilization or fire from heaven or somebody dies or think of Herod, you know, was uh, he died. He was eaten by worms. Right. Um, You know, things like that that uh, or Ananias and Sapphira, they died right there. Judgment came. But here, the wrath of God is not seen that way. He gives them up. Um, Did you know, uh, well, actually, instead of keeping them from sinning further and incurring more wrath, God's wrath is seen by giving them up to their evil desires. That's what his wrath is. I asked Bob about that one time. Why does God, why doesn't he just make them follow him? And mom said, God does not want robots. Yeah, it's, but here we're talking about somebody who doesn't want God, and so he oh. gives them up. So okay. first thing I want to point out is if he gives them up, there's a point where he's keeping them from, right? So in other words, there's a restraint that's there. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, there's a point where he says, okay. He removes that restraint. Um, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but there's just several places where it tells us uh, that God keeps sinners from sinning further uh, as a, as a, it's a um, revelation of his mercy, keeps natural people from sinning. I don't know if you ever thought of this, but we know that he does. If you look at Genesis 21 through 6, I'm just going to read this real quick from, this is Abraham. Remember he lied about his, uh, this is my sister, this is my wife, which was half true, but he did this twice. He did it to Pharaoh and Pharaoh got judged for it. God didn't keep him from sinning, but Abimelech, um, which was probably a name and a title as well. Um, that there were like kings and Abimelech was sort of the name that you associated, you would take on that name. But anyway, from there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he journeyed in Gerar. This is Genesis 21 through 6. Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to, a, think, listen to this, God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, behold, you are a dead man. <laughs> Imagine God saying that to you. Because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. So he's pleading, and God says, no, no, I'm just obeying, I'm just doing what he said. Um, and uh, God said to him in a dream, so God answers him. Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and listen to this, it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God kept him from sinning um, so, so he wouldn't be killed and so his people wouldn't be wiped out. I mean, that is a pretty amazing thing. I don't know if there, you ever caught that when you're reading that, but there are other places too that shows up. Um, but God does, in God's mercy, he does keep um, sinners from sinning more fully and incurring more wrath, and it really is mercy. Um, we see God's wrath here, though, in in Romans 1, is not fire from the sky or flood from the earth, but in him removing the barriers to further sin. Um, the wrath of God in Romans 1 is not an active outpouring of his displeasure as we would expect it, but rather the removal of restraint that allows sinners to reap the just fruits of their rebellion. Um, I like what one commentator wrote when he was describing this passage. He said, God ceased to hold the boat as it was dragged by the current of the river. So the boat was being pulled down the river. God was holding it. And they said, just let go, let go. And so God said, okay. You know, and they went down the river, and they got the punishment. Um, this giving over to sin is found in a few other places. Psalm 81, 11 through 12 says, But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts uh, to follow their own counsels. In other words, to do what they want. There's whatever their heart wanted. Um, I think this is, at least for me, it's very instructive to me. Um, we gain a better understanding of how God's wrath is revealed. So when you look at our society, we shouldn't, according to Romans 1, look at the rampant homosexuality and same-sex marriage and the deviations and all the perversions and say, God is just in judging our country. And that is true. But the proper thing, according to Romans 1, is say, God is judging our country by those behaviors. He's giving them over to what their hearts desire, and they will receive in themselves due penalty for their, for their sin. Um, so what is God's response to this exchange? Um, God gives them over to their sin. Um, probably good that when he chastises us Christians sometimes to get back in line, it's probably a good thing. Yes, you don't want Let's God. Them, you don't want God to say, "Okay." Yeah, <laughs> see, that, that makes a lot of sense what you're talking about. Like, I right. can see what you're saying. I mean, I think of a, a child. If a child disobeys Left and disobeys, there and you protect them from the consequences as much as you can. But there comes a point where you just need to step back and let them face the consequences so they learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a painful thing. It's a painful thing as a parent to let that happen. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. So I can cover this last one pretty quick. Uh, what did God give them up to? It says in verse 24, 26, 28, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts. God gave them up to dishonorable passions. God gave them up to a debased mind. So looking at the lust and passions, which I think are very, very similar. Um, again, there's sort of some parallelism here. They, mm -hmm. they kind of mirror each other. Um, lust of their hearts and dishonorable passions, I think, describes the depravity of the sins that God gave them up to. The phrase lust of their hearts literally means desires of their hearts. So God gave them over to what they wanted to do, in other words. Um, they lust and they wanted to do something. They were driven for it. God was restraining them. And his judgment and his wrath, he gave them over to that. So at one point, God is restraining them from their desires. 
Um, and I've heard people get mad at God for not letting them do what they want to do. <laughs> they, they don't have the ability, right? And they don't understand that, you know, you want God to restrain you from doing. But anyway, um, the phrase dishonorable passions simply means disgraceful lust. Um, the desires of the hearts led to men giving up a natural relation with women for other men and the same for women. They all received in themselves a due penalty for their errors. Um, this is loaded statement has been interpreted in many ways, but the statement I mean is the, they all received in themselves a due penalty for their error. Um, I remember back in the late 80s, a lot of pastors were saying, well, that's AIDS and that's these diseases. And that may have some, um, that may have, um, some truth to it, but I would say that every sin has a built-in penalty. Um, some are more immediate than others, but all sin eventually will be judged by a holy God. That is the place I would go and say they received in themselves a due penalty for their perversion. I would move a little few verses later in Romans 2, 5, where he talks about they are storing up wrath for themselves for the day of God's judgment. Um, so there's a day of judgment that everybody will face, and they're storing in themselves. They have their own cup, and they're filling that cup with wrath, 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 and someday they're going to drink it full to the end. So that due penalty for their perversion, I believe, is speaking to that future day of judgment. There may be an immediate judgment. Um, but that's not always the case. I mean, again, you look in Ecclesiastes, you see the wicked man succeeding. Many minor prophets say, why do the wicked succeed and the good people get punished? What's going on here? I think it'd be the other way around. And it's confusing to us, but I think it's because we have a short view. If you take the long view, uh, when God makes everything right, um, you know, then you don't want to be on, on their side. Um, so in this whole passage, what would you say the greatest evil is? Um, real quickly, I would say the greatest evil is they forsake, forsake, forsook, they you know, forsook God, and they wanted what they wanted. So they exchanged glory for a lie, in essence. That's the great evil. And in, in Jeremiah 2.13, uh, God says this specifically. It's one of my touchstone verses. They've committed two evils. They have forsaken me, and they've hewn out sisters from themselves, sisters that can't hold water. Futile, right? You might even say futility. Um, all these layer on top of each other. It's the same thing, just said slightly different ways. Um, so in Romans 1, they exchange God for images, and they exchange truth for lie. These are the evils in the passage. We have a tendency to look at these sins. People that sin, unlike us, we go, well, those are great evils, right? But really, the evil goes back to the original decision they made of forsaking God. That is what God sees as evil, these two great evils. Now, when he was talking to Jeremiah, there were lots of other bad things that the people were doing, but that's not what God focused on. He said, they've forsaken me, and they've hewn out cisterns. And he says, the root of the issue is they don't, they don't honor me, they don't thank me, they don't, um, they don't reference me, they don't even believe in me. They don't live like they believe. That is the root issue, not the sins. You, you, can, you can attack somebody at their sins, and you can turn them into a Pharisee. <laughs> but their heart is still wicked because they forsake God and they follow their own devices. And they may be reforming themselves to make them more conformable to you so they can be your friend. Well, that doesn't make them saved, right? So uh, just be, be careful at what you, uh, how you witness. Uh, go at the root issue. The root issue is they forsake God and they create their own images. Um, so um, God gives them to a debased mind. This is the last thing, a uh, debased mind. The third way that God gives them up is to this debased mind. It, it's, the meaning is interesting. It means somebody who has a debased mind, they can't pass a test. Um, if you can, uh, if, it's just hard for me to wrap that around because I just think debased as in a deviated or depraved mind. But that word literally means they can't pass a test, um, that they're, they're rejected. Their mind is rejected. Their mind is a castaway mind. And is, that's the word that's used here. Um, and this is a mind that's hostile to God, and this is a mind that in no way can please God. We'll see many months from now, we're in Romans 8, which is the best chapter, I think, in the best book. Uh, it says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It doesn't have any ability to even submit to God's law. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I think that's the debased mind here. He, he gave them over to this debased mind that simply can't please God. Um, Verses 26 and 27 in Romans 1, in closing here, I think gives the clearest condemnation of homosexuality. I just can't skip over this in the New Testament. Paul describes it as shameful, unnatural, indecent, and a perversion. In the society of the Greco-Roman world saw homosexuality as no big deal. It was no big deal. And some even said it was a superior relationship. They, they taught that. One historian records that 14 of the first 15 emperors 
were homosexuals um, historically. And so if you're a Christian who tries to make peace with the sin of homosexuality, and there are those that do that, it's really attempting to say that what God condemns is good. So you're placing yourself above God. God says this is wrong, and you're saying, no, it's okay, right? And the very thing that God gives people over to in his wrath to let them receive punishment, you're saying that's okay, that's no big deal. That's a dangerous place to be as a teacher who claims to be speaking for God. Really, it places that kind of teacher in the false prophet area where um, many times God says, I didn't say what you said that I said. <laughs> You're going to say God said, the Lord says, and I didn't say that, and they receive very severe judgment. Um, so in closing, God gives these men in Romans 1 over to a debased mind or a, a castaway mind, a rejecting mind, and this description indicates the inability to think clearly on moral issues. You may run across somebody that you talk to that has a debased mind like this, and you say something that you think is a generally accepted truth, a moral truth, and they're just so warped in their thinking that they question everything. No, I don't believe that. Oh, that's good for you. That might work for you. It doesn't work for me. It's just they, they have this debased mind. Um, and then you see the result of this is they do what ought to be done. Now, what ought to be done, I believe it's pointing before what's been described in the previous verses, verses 24 through 27. I think as we go into it next week, it's pointing to uh, the description of them um, in the following verses, 29 to 31. So I think it's, it's sort of a bridge to this next section. What did God give them up to? God gave them over to the lust of their hearts, dishonorable passions. He gave them over to a debased mind. So that's all I have for today. Any questions before we, we pray? I want to say something. Back in the 90s, I hung out with the natives, okay? I went to powwows, basically lived at powwows, and they held gay women up real high. And I thought being gay wasn't a sin because they prayed in the name of Jesus. I knew nothing about being a Christian yet. I didn't know there was little... <laughs> and that's just what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. I know now that. So yeah. the only the um, it seems like a very very dark. I mean, it's it's this is a very dark chapter, but it is. No, um, it's so interesting too. It gets no. worse. If there's any consolation, we get to three. If you want to read ahead in chapter three, when he ends this section talking about how bad we really are. It's helping me with some of my. Stupid thinking, I'll say. Yeah. You know? But hopefully you walk out of this. When you look at this, yeah, I, I love this children's. I mentioned this children's Bible that I used to um, read to our kids. And every bad, it covered everything in the Old Testament, right? But at the end of every bad story, or it seemed like there was no hope, it says, it looks like there's no hope, but someday there's coming a king. There's coming a Messiah who will make this right, who will, who will pay for these sins. And so we as Christians, we, we are people of light. And I don't have time to expand this, but... If you take what Paul did and talked about salvation, and he's pointing back towards creation, um, it's really it's the parallels between our salvation and creation are really amazing. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be light, and we were saved, and the world started, and life began, and life began with me. And, you know, it was like they got brighter and brighter in Revelation and greater and greater as he created, and in our life we keep on progressing better and better and greater and greater, and there's more and more light. Till the end of Revelation, remember when the city of Jerusalem comes down? Um, Pastor talked about this last week and the last couple of weeks. When the city of Jerusalem comes down, it says there's no need. It's so bright, the light is so bright that Christ lives. There's no need for the sun or the moon because Christ is our lamp. Oh, wow. He is our light. Yeah, yeah. So you start off with darkness before creation. Then as God speaks into light, we were dead. We were in our darkness. Our hearts were darkened. And he created a miracle of creation in our, in our lives and made us alive, as it says. He made us alive in Christ. And so really each one of us is, the, is a miracle of creation. You know, it took me 53 years to get saved. And, oh and it was just on time. Yeah. No, God seriously. knew exactly. It just... And I'm so on fire for the Lord every since. Praise the Lord. May we may we all be that way. <laughs> well, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these truths. Uh, some of these things are are hard to hard to read because they are they are negative. But we also see that they come from your mind, and these are things that man would not invent. Um, this is this is coming from outside of time that has an understanding of men's hearts. Uh, 
No other man would be able to look at another man and know what's going on in their hearts except for you. And so you are sharing with us things that uh, only you can see. And we pray that as we read this, that we would conform our way of thinking to your way of thinking. Um, we pray that um, this would empower us to witness to those around us, that, that we would see the power of salvation, the power of the gospel, the power of the light that's shining into people's hearts, and we would celebrate. So every baptism we see, every conversion that we see, we know it is, is your power and your gospel that's worked in that person's heart. So we pray that you would make us faithful at proclaiming, procra- proclaiming uh, the gospel um, of, the, of light, the gospel of truth uh, to other people, and uh, work together with you Um, so you can work in their hearts and make them new, um, and they will become our brother and sister too. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen.